tickles me. It makes me hunger to understand more about the human, the human race and who we really are and how we're in this together as a world, not as a country, you know, not as individuals. Most of us think that if we want to meet new people, we need to be surrounded by as many people as possible. But many times the people that we are surrounded up by are just like us in many ways. If you want to meet people that are completely different from you, you need to undertake adventures. And that is one of the reasons why Stephanie goes on adventures and meets new people and gets deeper insights on why people are the way they are. After all, we are all the same in many ways and we are different in most exciting ways. Thank you, Stephanie, for being here with us today. And we are so excited to hear from you. Obviously, you must have been asked this question many times. It's, what's your response to, are you crazy? Like, <laughs> why? why? Why are you doing this? Well, you know, the people who know me don't ask that because they already know I'm crazy. <laughs> um, but why am I doing this? It, I wanted to go through the Yukon Flats. I hadn't been through them yet. And it's a na national preserve up there. And it's hundreds of thousands of square miles, you know, and it's, it's all the birds from all over the world come up there, up north. Because when they migrate, they don't know the difference between countries, you know, so they're up there. And I just really wanted to spend time in a, in a preserve like that that was in the wilderness. And um, so that was the first piece that made me want to do this trip. And then I was looking at it and thinking, well, why don't I just go as far as I can? And um, which would be Ammonic, which is about 10 miles from the Bering Straits. Um, and I don't know if I can get down the Straits because of river parades and the headwinds and all of that. I might be able to run the tide down and run the tide back. We'll have to see how risky it is when I get there. But um, so there was some, there was some of that was just the environment and I love the environment and I love being a river rat. It's like wind in the river, <laughs> wind in the willows. I get to, I get to live on my, you know, with my boat and camp every night and nobody calls me to come inside you know, <laughs> for dinner or to sleep. I just stay outside all day long and I don't ever have to go inside. Um, so, it's, so I like being outdoors. And I think the other part is it's, a, it's deeply spiritual for me. And um, there's nothing like being alone in the middle of nowhere for you, for you to face yourself and see yourself and allow yourself to, to become more of who you are and sense of um, all other input is, you know, from communities and all of that is our all artificial input is out is it's it's just nature in me and I get to kind of evolve with being out there and being doing that you know and it's a good time in my life I'm 65 not getting any younger <laughs> this isn't these aren't things I'm going to be able to do probably my whole life although I'll probably try and um and I've had some really challenging years. I think that's typical for people my age, you know, struggles with, with family and, you know, death of parents and siblings. And, and uh, I, I think I need it to clear my headspace. I, need, I think I need it to finish whatever work I'm doing with all those transitions and become more of myself, you know, more centered. So it's a very spiritual journey for me to be in nature. For me, the way to get that is to go into the bush. I grew up in Canada, and we there was acreage, and every had acreage, and it was all bush. And so we woke up in the morning, and we went out in the bush, you know, and we got called in by a whistle, you know, for a few meals. But um, so it's always been my solace. If I was upset as a child, I ran into the bush and played. And so it's always kind of been my mother nature, you know, my landing place, my sacred place because I grew up that way, you know. Uh, you said that, you know, it, you've been doing this since you were 18, because you grew up like that. How did it change you as a person? You know, leaving, leaving home at 18, actually, you know, 17, because I graduated early, but, um, and being so naive, you know, growing up in a very small rural place, and, you know, smart, I read a lot, I'd always read a lot, but I, I had no experience. 
And my first trip over to Europe, hitchhiking around and going down to Africa, and this was, and I was the youngest. Most people over there just, it was their like graduation from college. And if you ever read Mitchner's Drifters, we were a group of drifters that drift and met, and you know, it's this all this interaction with young people from all countries, stay in pensions and youth hostels and places where young people gathered. And um, it changed my life. It opened my mind. It allowed me to see that. You know, allow me to understand different um, cultures and different religions and how important they are to that culture and why and historically and environmentally. It, it, it take, took me from being egocentric and like country centric to becoming more world centric. Um, it, 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 op it opened, it just opened my mind so that that made me hunger for more, you know. I spent another oh, over a year there traveling um, through Europe, through the Middle East. I was in the war in the Middle East. I had a, um, a big crane. I had bought a little doucheable I was sleeping in and traveling in 1959, a little Citroen. And I uh, threw out the back seats and made a bed back there. And I had, the crane had to lift my car up onto a Russian freighter to take me to Alexandria to get out of the, out of the war. And then, and then the only way home was to cross North Africa, which I didn't find out till after I got to Morocco that those roads weren't open except for military vehicles <laughs> through eastern through western egypt and Libya and Tunisia. you know it's just like i guess i think i had a state of grace going on but yeah it fuels me it makes me hunger to understand more about the human the human race and who we really are and how we're in this together as a world not as a country you know not as individuals what is the biggest lesson that you have learned since you were 18 265. I know nothing. <laughs> um, no matter how hard I prepare, no matter how many scenarios I go through in my head, my experience uh, is totally, it's always a surprise and always different than what I expect. I can't possibly project the experience that I'm going to have. When I was just up in the Arctic last year, I went up to Nagunik in the village for a while, and then I was up in Barrow too for a first stint. Um, I prepared, I thought I thought I knew what I was gonna experience. Although I know I can't know, but, and um, it was just so different and so inspiring. And so like being in 24 hour darkness, one of the things I asked the students, I was, I was doing junior high, high school special education was what do you prefer? 24 hour daylight, 24 hour darkness. And they all said 24 hour darkness. And that was such a surprise for me because I'm, I'm used to light during the day. Um, but as I spent more and more time in the darkness, it became exquisite. It, it became soft, like dark chocolate melting around you. And everybody kind of moves through this. And, and then when I went up there in the spring and all the sun, the sun was up for, I don't know, 22 hours, the, um, and it was bouncing off all the glacier ice and you know, all the, all the, it was so bright and so intense, I, I go nuts. So I, I start finally understood why they preferred the darkness. It was like a rest, but you get to rest for six months and then you go on for six months and you hunt and you fish and you whale and you do these things for your village to survive. And then you sleep. Um, soon as soon as the fishing season start or a whale comes in, the, the villagers are allowed to only get um, two um, opportunities to get a whale. Um, so they can only throw two harpoons whether they get it or not. So they're really careful and, and the whale will feed the whole village for, for the whole winter. Um, so uh, I just I admire the way they live on the land and how careful they are and how they protect it, you know. So I'm trying hard to visualize how it was for you to find your way out of a war. I don't think I'm doing a very good job. What you're saying is, is how I feel. It's like I only know mm -hmm. like in the war in Lebanon, you know, but we can't, I can't, I don't think it, as humans, we can often know what an experience is until we've experienced it. Um, and that's what brings compassion I, too. I think the more we understand how it, I mean, I had this short stint, uh, Beirut was beautiful. It was a megalopolis. It was an amazing city. And the next morning I woke up and it was on fire. Um, and so, you know, I, and I had met some Palestinians and they, they rode shotgun on my car and we made it 
do the docks where I had my boat lifted onto a freighter or my boat, my car. Um, and that was a short stint, but it gave me a better understanding of, of things that are going on in the world and how people become refugees and what, how it can change overnight and they're no different than I am, you know. Like when I'm talking to you, I'm absorbing you as a person as you are right now. Mm -hmm. Your voice, your image, your personality, because I really want to see it after three months, how it changes. Mm -hmm. And I, I look forward to that. And it's, I don't know if, if we can see the change, but I, I'm sure that I'm going to change in ways that I can't even predict. And... Um, I'll be the same person when I come back, but but I'll have some new insights, you know. Hopefully, you know, my hope, my my goal is to become more and more compassionate, um, less and less reactive, and to live my life with loving kindness, to help others, you know, to, to be present in that moment. And these kinds of journeys help one to become more of that, at least for me. You know? When you meet a stranger, you have no baggage, no history, no, you know, you just meet and your eyes catch if you're going to connect. And you connect in the moment and it's so beautiful. And, and you've touched someone and they've touched you. And uh, when I went to, the, to film the eclipse in Oregon, in Eastern Oregon, uh, two summers ago now, I guess, um, I ended up in a homeless camp. And in the morning, people were crawling out of the, the desert, you know, and coming in and, and everybody was kind and good morning and shared their name and introduced. And I just kept making as much coffee as I could. And I met the most fascinating people. And it's easy to be compassionate to the people you love, but can we be compassionate to the people that are disdained or looked down upon or not supported or for, but for the grace of God, there go I. And I think that that's, that's a big piece of who I am and how I want to connect because I'm a traveler and I'm a seeker. And coming into village, I will probably, I will meet a lot of amazing people, but there's a protocol. This is really important when you come into village. Some, some floaters will, um, you know, go in and buy out the, the store because it's a little tiny store as big as a dining room, you know, and barge or the, might not come in with extra food for a week or two, depending on weather and yada, yada. So there's a whole protocol, you know, of the North. It, it's slow. It's always slow. It's, it's, it's always giveaway. You, you come in with gifts. You, so I get, I come into a village. I don't jump on my boat and run to the store and have a shower. You know, I stay at my boat. I schmooze, I wait for people to come down, you know, we talk, we introduce ourselves, we, we do that ritual, I do a giveaway, I ask for the elders, where the elder lives, um, and I take, I take a gift to the elder and ask permission to be on their land. Um, and, and so there's a whole piece of that that's validating, you know, validating who you are, this is your land, I am, I am an interloper. And are you okay with me being here? Um, and I, I think I, I think I'm going to meet some extraordinary people that have, that have lived that whose people have, peoples have lived there for thousands of years, and, um, and that's going to be incredibly amazing. Just out of curiosity, what gifts do you carry? What gifts? Oh, what, what? well, what I learned up north, and I taught up there too for a few years back in the day. Um, is that everybody wants coffee, the elders, you know, and, um, and I think partly because it's a community, it, it, people come together a lot for, and, you know, and they come, they come together a lot in different ways. And so this people make coffee, you know, so I'm bringing bags of ground coffee to give away to the elders and, um, and the kids, I'm doing two things. I'm, I, they, they want candy. They, the kids all just want candy. It's a sugar thing. And so I'm going to bring a bag of candy, but um, I've got extra paracord, a really thin cord. Um, and I can make uh, survival bracelets, you know, little things, you know, 
So, so I'm uh, so when I'm sitting in the flat, sprinting in a circle, waiting for the current to pick me up, I can make these survival bracelets, and I can hand them out to kids when I get to the village or teach them how to make it. Or so I'm trying to, you know, I've got a few ideas like that um, that I, I I hope you know it has to be small, it has to be light, and so that's that's part of my giveaway. <laughs> This this has been so, just talking to you for half an hour has been so exciting for me. Yeah. I can only imagine what will it be to do this for three months. Well, I appreciate you. I do. I, I appreciate you talking to me. That's wonderful. And I